Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Empowering Workload Automation with Intelligence. My name is Raleigh Gould and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Our featured speakers are Dan Twing, President and COO at Enterprise Management Associates, and Jennifer Chiswick, Head of Product for Atomic Automation Intelligence at Broadcom. Dan has over 25 years of experience in information systems, software development, and technology outsourcing. Dan focuses on all aspects of intelligent and automated management of IT. Jennifer came to Broadcom via their acquisition of Terma Software, where she was a founder and the chief technology officer. She started Terma Software in 2002 to address the need for predictive analytics in the distributed and mainframe automation markets. And before I hand things over to today's featured speakers, I wanted the audience to know that Dan and Jennifer will be concluding today's presentation by taking your questions. Feel free to log them anytime by using the Q&A functionality. Also, today's event is being recorded, and you will receive a follow-up email from EMA, which will include the on-demand playback, a PDF of the speaker slides, and some additional resources from Broadcom. So I hope you will check that email out. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn things over to our first featured speaker, Dan Twing. Dan? Thanks, Raleigh. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are, and thank you for joining us today. Before I get into workload automation specifics, I thought I would start with some broader IT automation trends that I've identified for 2020. Um, this is in part a result of some research that I did along with Dennis Rogseth earlier this year. Uh, that research is called Data-Driven IT Automation. We looked at all forms of IT automation, including workload, but it was much broader than that. And coming out of that and just other things that are going on in the space, um, I developed this list uh, that for me are, are really the big five uh, that are happening in automation. And it really does, uh, you know, sort of foreshadow some of the things that are happening with automation intelligence. So the first trend uh, really helps to support, um, you know, it's really a big one, the, the democratized IT automation. It really helps to support folks uh, more generally. And, and really what we're seeing is uh, empowering citizen automators, citizen developers, uh, allowing for sort of low-code, no-code integration and automation definition. Uh, we're seeing this in a number of the workload tools. We're seeing it in a number of other IT automation tools. Um, and, and that trend really kind of supports the second trend, which is broader integration. So whether that integration is done by uh, the users themselves or whether it's developed by the software vendor, it's a more uh, – you know, specific integration to another application. Um, we see these tools being integrated much more uh, full-featured upstream and downstream um, and across a number of tools. And then this trend for data-driven automation, which was actually the topic uh, or the title of the research that we did earlier this year, um, really showing a lot of uh, machine learning data that's driving automation. There's a lot of AI uh, operations tools that are, are sort of a key source for data that, that is driving and will, uh, in the future, I think, increase uh, driving automation. So, you know, for automation to become more intelligent, it needs uh, more data sources uh, to sort of evaluate what's happening. And we're seeing more and more of this data-driven uh, coming into the automation. The fourth trend is, is really a unification of automation tools. Um, our research is shown across a number of studies that users really want fewer, more broadly functioning automation tools. So the tools they have are, are useful, but there's so many different ones and they really want to see fewer with more, more broad functions. And that unification is really underway in many organizations, and we measured that in this other research. And then finally, automation is really key to supporting all of these digital transformation efforts that are ongoing, and the need for that digital transformation has really, uh, the pressure has gone up with the, with the pandemic. So with that as a backdrop, then uh, I thought we would talk more specifically about workload automation and automation intelligence 
supporting workload automation. Um, so one of the things that uh, comes out when we talk to folks about workload automation is this dilemma of multiple schedulers. Um, and really, you, you, you know, workload automation is such a critical aspect to overall IT operations, it's one of the more critical tools to make operations effective. Um, you know, and there are some very good tools out there that in and of themselves uh, provide a lot of capabilities in their own right. But many organizations have more than one, and so that limits the power uh, because you can't use those features to see across all workloads or even some workloads that start in one scheduler, maybe on the mainframe, and end in a different scheduler in a distributed environment. So that, that really limits the power of some of these tools. Um, and our research has shown that 59% of organizations surveyed use more than one workload automation software. So it's, it's, uh, it's certainly more than half. Uh, and, you know, you can make an effort to migrate to a single tool, but Really, it, it continues to happen over time for a variety of reasons that organizations really seem to struggle to, to get to and then stay on a single, a single workload tool. And when you have multiple tools, it makes it more difficult to see these end-to-end -end processes. And without that view, it, it's really hard to identify and resolve problems as they develop. So I've got a couple of data points on that topic. Uh, the, the first, we asked, why are you using multiple products? So I've already said, you know, 59% use multiple products. Here, speaking just to that group, we're asking why do you have multiple products? And you can see that the number one answer is that they're using um, different groups, different teams require different scheduling tools is, is the number one reason. 34% um, said that they're in the middle of converting from one to another, but there are many who have really long-lasting reasons to stay in this situation where they have multiple tools, either because of a knowledge gap between the different tools, the legacy systems that are there, um, limitations in integrations or just things that were already integrated that they don't want to have to integrate again. Um, but for a, for a variety of reasons, organizations continue to use, you know, multiple workload schedulers. Now here I have two data points, and I'm going to focus first on the chart on the left, where we've broken down the group who ha has said that they um, have multiple schedulers, and we did this by revenue. So you can sort of see, you know, how bigger organizations that top there, the billion or more, relate maybe to some of the others that you know have a hundred million to a billion in revenue, or twenty million to a hundred million, and so on. Uh, the bars, the green bar is we have no problems for multiple schedulers. And there are many organizations who say, you know, I don't have these issues. But there are others, the yellow bar, that have minimal issues, the red that have frequent problems. And you can see that, you know, in those larger organizations, there are significant uh, numbers, 38, you know, uh, 35 to 38 percent. Uh, in that billion or more and in that 20 million or more that still have frequent problems with multiple schedulers. And then the blue bar are those that are already using analytics to manage the complications from having multiple schedulers. And really the significant uh, standout for me here is that group 100 million to a billion in revenue. You can see that the red bar is pretty short there. It's less than 10%. But that's because over 50% of them are already using analytics to manage these issues. And, and in that billion or more, you can see that the red bar is just a little longer than the blue bar. So, you know, 32, 33% have, are using analytics, but a higher number, 35, 36%, still are struggling with these, these issues. So, you know, certainly for some organizations, um, analytics have already resolved this issue, but many others are still living with it. Um, and we also asked, uh, the, looking at the pie chart on the right, are you considering rationalizing to a single schedule? 88% said they were. The reality is most of them will never get there. Um, they'll, you know, they'll pick a new tool and they won't convert the old folks. They'll, 
you know, just as they get everything in, you know, to one schedule, they'll do an acquisition and the new company will come in using a different schedule. I mean, it, it, it seems difficult in most large enterprises to, to ever resolve to a single schedule. Um, and this is one area where automation intelligence can really help manage this. Um, Jennifer, you might have a story here that uh, you could share with us that backs up this data. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Yeah, this is really fascinating to look at all of these uh, statistics. It, it, it really aligns with my experience, having been in the workload automation space for many years and watching, um, you know, some of the largest companies in the world, how their automation um, environments have evolved in and, um, you know, seeing this uh, kind of quantified really does uh, validate what, I, what I've seen in my experience, that almost all um, large IT organizations are now running multiple workload automation engines, whether they're vendor provide or provided or homegrown. Um, it's, a, it's an evolving ecosystem. And there is this, uh, this uh, goal to, you know, to rationalize to a single product. That's a common goal that I hear companies say, well, we really want to move everything to X automation engine. And what I've found, um, I've, I've witnessed, you know, a few of these migration efforts, and they're very difficult. I mean, these automation engines are all, they all have their own nuances, and it's so difficult to uh, migrate hundreds of thousands of jobs from one engine to another. So, um, this is one of the areas with, with analytics where, number one, um, we can be very helpful by, by providing a single pane of glass to, um, to give you a insight into all of the automation engines that you're, that you're running uh, from one single pane of glass. And in addition, if you do want to do that migration, um, that analytics can be really essential in helping you do that in a, in a um, kind of a structured um, way where you can you can migrate an application at a time instead of trying to migrate an entire instance. So it's a, kind of a combination of of learning how to better manage multiple workload automation engines and also uh, being able to systematically intelligently uh, do this migration if in fact that is your your end goal. Great. Thanks for adding some some color there. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we've we've seen that that those who do use analytics can resolve uh, or or live with these multiple schedulers in a, in a much better way rather than than actually you know go through that migration. So it's it's a choice to you know to migrate or to live with it. But you certainly can live with it, and you can see many organizations and many of the large organizations are doing just that. Another thing that analytics can improve is just the overall management of the automation. Um, so automation intelligence is really a companion product, the way I look at it, to workload. It integrates multiple scheduling solutions, and it, it can really change the operations model because it creates a more comprehensive view. It provides insights because it's looking at this historical data and comparing the historical norms with the current results. Um, the automation intelligence improves operations because it reveals business insights um, and it increases the, the business success by, by focusing on those business outcomes. And automation intelligence can really improve the scheduling process because it, it gives you a better understanding of the capacity needs um, as new jobs are added and it allows for modeling and what-if analysis so that you can better plan for changes. And I have a couple of data points on that uh, topic. First of all, for those that are, are prioritizing issues, um, you know, the, the biggest uh, pain points that, that folks think that they can address with the analytics is 38% said that it helps them prioritize issues. And uh, also 38%, so really topping in first place, also is um, for capacity planning, just understanding um, you know, how to prioritize the issues, how to, how to plan for capacity. Also, um, you can see predicting job failures, um, deciding where to place workloads. Uh, there's certainly a lot of benefits uh, to using the analytics. And when, when we ask those that actually are using them, 
um, which of the following benefits do you do you actually get? So the first one was, what do you think it will help you with? And here is, what's it actually helping you with? Um, improved management, just overall, 58%. Um, and right behind that is identifying threats to SLAs. So um, really just that overall management. And then there's really a benefit to um, improving business resiliency because you, it also helps you understand those capacity issues, it helps you plan for problems and even predict problems as, as they're uh, developing. We also asked, uh, what are your key reasons for future investments? So these are folks that already are doing analytics and then we're asking them further, um, what else do you expect it to benefit? And the top reason here is uh, uh, in and around security. So just having that, that better understanding of the environment and overall operational efficiency is, is right behind that. So those folks who, who thought they'd get benefit did get benefit and they're intending to continue to invest to get further benefit. So um, it's clear that, that the analytics and the automation intelligence can really help make that environment uh, easier and better to manage. Now, as, I, as the last uh, section told us too, a big area is improving the management of, around SLAs. Um, and anybody who's had to, to live with these metrics knows that uh, the longer a problem runs, the deeper the hole that you're digging that you have to get out of, right, to keep your SLAs on track. So the sooner that you can find a problem and resolve the impact, uh, the easier it's going to be to get your numbers back on track for the month, right? You, you want to have the, the shortest uh, problem that you can. If you if you can't prevent the problem, then keep the problem. You know, identify it early and fix it fast. And automation intelligence really helps you do that. Um, it uses this machine learning to build this historical record, um, and then you can identify variances and anomalies as they're developing and give you much earlier warning to developing issues. Um, these predictive analytics can really see and alert potential SLA violations you know, in near real time. Um, so therefore you're, you're, you're more effective with your, uh, with dynamic management of SLAs and can quickly identify the root cause, resolve the issues before the SLA is not too far off track. Um, and then automation intelligence can also include prescriptive actions. So instead of just alerting you something is, is happening and then alerting you where you're at in the, in that status, um, it can even help suggest things that would make uh, that would correct it and help you get the remediation in place as quickly as possible, up to and including automated defining automated remediation. So if you see this, then take that action. Um, and an automated reaction is certainly going to be much quicker than a human reaction. Um, and all of that just helps to keep the SLAs uh, more on track. So we, we asked, how do you manage critical SLAs in your workload environment? And we do see that 95% are managing SLAs in some way in conjunction with workload automation. Only 14% are using predictive analytics, though, and auto remediation to alert and correct problems. So while most folks have some awareness of SLAs in their workload tools, those with these uh, with automation intelligence and advanced analytics um, is only running at 14% today. There's a lot of room for the, the market as a whole to add more uh, capabilities in, in this area. So we also asked them, what type of analytics capabilities do you currently have in production? And while 88% had some analytics capabilities uh, in and around their SLA monitoring, um, you know, we, we still see that, you know, SL is direct SLA monitoring is about 48% of the market. And of the 12% who aren't doing anything in this space right now, um, half of them uh, intend to add analytics soon. So these may be folks that are using analytics within a single workload tool um, and haven't yet advanced uh, all the way to the, the broader automation intelligence. Um, but there's clearly benefit to SLAs on a number of touch points. Another area that automation analytics really can, can help uh, improve is DevOps. Um, as we said, digital transformation has significantly increased 
the pressure to develop new apps and processes, um, and this is just creating more urgency to change. But we all know change can bring problems to the production environment. So we really want to do that in a very cautious fashion, even as we attempt to speed that up and do smaller, more frequent releases. Um, one of the goals of DevOps really is to, to accelerate application delivery. Um, and automation intelligence, with its modeling and what-if analytics, really allows IT to deploy changes more confidently and, and faster. 85% um, of IT organizations really have shown in our research that they believe they benefit from the ability to simulate changes. So, you know, we asked what are the most important technical needs for workload automation, um, and real-time monitoring came right right to the top, uh, followed by managing growth in workloads and supporting DevOps, both uh, tying for second. Um, and certainly, in automation intelligence really provides uh, a lot of help here with the with the modeling and the what if analysis, so that you can really know what's going to happen before you push changes. And we also asked. Uh, what other corporate systems do you integrate workload performance or definitional data? And DevOps tools, uh, you know, examples here, Jenkins, Docker, Ansible, these are all tools that, uh, you know, top the list. So DevOps being the most integrated point, service desk, and then central dashboards being the top three. So there's a real linkage here uh, to DevOps with workload and then the automation intelligence just improves that that linkage. Um, Jennifer, you have uh, a story about one of your clients uh, and how DevOps has been improved with automation intelligence. Yes, actually, um, thanks, Dan. It's you know it's interesting because automation comes up uh, in relationship to DevOps all the time because you know people want to automate their DevOps pipelines and it's a common uh, it's common use of of automation engines. Uh, what, what often you don't think about, though, is that the automation engine itself really would benefit from the same type of DevOps rigor that's applied to, to building applications. Because, you know, as your applications are evolving, you're adding new jobs, you're changing dependencies, and it's really important to understand if those modifications are going to have uh, downstream impacts on your SLAs. So one of our um, large clients was um, <clears throat> they they actually ran into a bit of a problem where they were putting a, um, a accounting application into production and they were in you know it it resulted in adding a few hundred jobs and quite a lot of changes to their to their workload dependencies etc that they just didn't anticipate the downstream impact that those changes would have on their SLAs and it caused a lot of problems. So um, working with this client, we were able to build um, basically a simulation uh, engine so that when the, when the, um, the next time they had uh, upgrades to the same accounting system, they were able to simulate the changes in their workload automation engine prior to moving them into production and seeing if those changes would actually affect some of their SLAs that they wouldn't have even anticipated. So applying... Um, that type of simulation in a DevOps uh, environment in an automated way. So basically, um, you would have a step as you're m migrating jobs into production that prior to migrating them into production, you actually do a simulation and make sure that you get a green light that the changes that you're about to make are not going to break any SLAs. As, a, as an automated step in the DevOps process before releasing new code into the engine um, has been has proven to be um, very fruitful. So uh, it's just an interesting an interesting approach. Yeah, absolutely. Had, you know, foresight uh, gives you a lot of uh, a lot of benefit before you're actually in production in a panic. <laughs> exactly. So um, the the final area I wanted to talk about uh, where analysts can really improve is the, is really executive buy-in and, and that, that touch point with the business. So there's been a major trend in workload automation over the last uh, five or six years to provide more direct 
um, business outcome specific information to business stakeholders. So, you know, it started with tying them in uh, with a few dashboards, maybe even alerts. In some cases, I've talked to folks who, you know, the, the business owner knows the key file transfer is important to their uh, part of the business. They maybe even are aware of, of failures and restarts. They might even be able to kick off a transfer themselves. Certainly, they're getting much more direct information. Well, automation intelligence really combines the end-to-end -end data across different systems so it can provide a more holistic view to the business users. They don't really want to know this subsystem is holding up my job. They just need to know that their job is finished, whether that's updating inventories, updating bank balances, um, whatever they need to do their job, they just want to know that it's on track and done. And they really don't want to hear about it in the language of the IT operations and the different subsystems, all oh, that stuck on the mainframe or what have you. Um, so one thing that uh, automation intelligence can do is even um, not just provide these dashboards and reporting, but because it has this end-to-end -end view, it can also, you know, re uh, phrase the conversation, if you will, and put the, the information into the language of the business user and start with the outcome they want and work backwards. Rather, you know, as IT folks, you know, we're in the, we're in the weeds. We're, we're, we're well aware it's a network issue or it's a, you know, it's a, it's a file that filled up or, you know, it's this CPU that, that is over capacity. Uh, but the business user, they just want to know how their job is doing, that it will be there when they need it. And using uh, automation intelligence, we can put it in their language, and that makes a huge difference to their uh, relationship with IT. So we asked uh, in, in another survey, please indicate your level of agreement with the following statement. Our business would benefit from executives having a better understanding of the impact of batch processing. And 85% agreed or strongly agreed that that. <laughs> They would be happier and the business would be better off if the execs had a better understanding of this world. We also asked them which of the following would help your executives better understand these environments. Um, improved dashboards right at the top of the list, 67%. Um, and, and really having trend-based reporting and alerts specific to the business, uh, all were seen as, as benefit. So, you know, to wrap up, I wanted to go back to these top five trends and just quickly highlight how automation intelligence really could touch every one of these. So, in and around the idea of democratized automation, automation intelligence by giving improved dashboards and the language of the business stakeholder um, really brings them more into the fold. It really um, they may do uh, some low-code or no-code um, definitions themselves, but automation intelligence, I think, really helps with the dialogue um, and makes those citizen automators that are impacted by the automation uh, more aware. Um, it certainly can help with the broad integration because, you know, it helps to integrate across tools. So, if, and uh, one thing I haven't really highlighted yet um, is the fact that the automation intelligence itself can get some data even back from some applications that have a richer status than what the workload tool may have about that. So there's a number of ways through open APIs where automation intelligence really kind of assists with the integration across the environment. Um, and certainly it hits on data-driven automation because that's what it is. Automation intelligence really is using machine learning to improve automation, um, it, it delivers the predictability, allows for the modeling, and that, that end point or end business outcome focus. Um, it certainly helps with unification of automation tools because it's integrating across multiple schedulers, so right away it's making them more unified. Um, and I predict that this category, automation intelligence, is going to expand beyond workload automation and, and assist with other tools. So I think it really will impact the unification trend. And of course, we've talked about how automation intelligence through its modeling and what if analysis can speed release cycles. So it also is uh, of help on supporting digital transformation. So I just wanted to revisit those. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer.
um, and she's going to tell us more about Atomic's automation intelligence product. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Chizik, and I'm the, the head of product at Broadcom for Atomic Automation Intelligence. And it's been so fascinating to me to um, listen to all of the analysis that Dan's done in this space because it really um, corresponds with, with the problems that we are trying to solve with Atomic Automation Intelligence, which is our, uh, our, our analytics platform that's specifically uh, geared towards towards automation environments. So what I really want to focus on for today's conversation is the fact that, that ultimately what we're trying to do with automation is to deliver a service. And if you're here listening to this webinar today, my guess is that you work in some way within the automation world. And it's a very complex world. As you know, there are a lot of concerns that go into setting up an automation environment. You have to pick platforms, mainframe versus distributed. What vendors' products are you going to use? Are you going to run your automation? You know, where are you going to run your automation? Public clouds, private clouds. There's all this talk about, you know, containerization, Docker images, Kubernetes, you know, all of these um, buzzwords and exciting technologies that are evolving in this world. And it's a very fertile ground and really interesting area to work in. But what often um, can happen is you, you lose sight of what the ultimate goal is. And what you're trying to do with these automation solutions is deliver a service. Uh, deliver a service um, to, to your, whether they're internal customers or external customers, um, you, you're ultimately going to be delivering a service. And what we're trying to help you do with Atomic Automation Intelligence is be able to deliver that service reliably, deliver it with visibility so that people can see what's going on and um, predict what what um, what will be happening. So that's the third bullet point is deliver the service predictably. Of course, you always want to deliver the service earlier and at a lower cost. Um, I just had a conversation uh, yesterday with a client of ours who, who told a, a, an interesting story about how one of their business users um, was able to uh, you know, what, what they ultimately wanted, what they were ultimately looking for, it was a large bank, was um, some some data feeds that would that were arriving at six in the morning, and they would use the information from those data feeds from these reports that they would get to make decisions about how they were going to um, borrow and lend money. And if they could get the that data a half an hour earlier, that opened up the ability for them to 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 perhaps buy or borrow money at a quarter of a point interest rate lower which ultimately when you're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars can represent, you know, a significant amount of money. So delivering a service earlier uh, has a huge impact on the bottom line of, of a customer. And of course, there's always the cost of, of running these automation processes. So you want to be able to do that as efficiently as possible. Um, and then as changes are happening to your service, which we were talking a little bit about before, you want to make sure that you can deliver those changes with confidence that they're not going to uh, to impact your business. So a little bit about atomic automation intelligence. Um, it really is a platform. It's an analytic platform that allows you to bring in and consolidate the data from all of your various workload automation engines. And um, this, this is always, you know, often, not always, but often go, going to be cross-platform. So as, as automation environments evolve, you perhaps have some, some scheduler running on the mainframe. Maybe you've got CA7 running on the mainframe, and perhaps you've got Control-M running in the distributed environment. So those are two different vendors, um, two different platforms, and yet they – they're both essential to delivering a service. So it's important that you have a single pane of glass across both of those platforms to be able to really see what's going on in your environment. So on the right here, you can see um, you can see the 
the list of the uh, automation engines that Atomic Automation Engine, Atomic Automation Intelligence supports either today or that we're working on supporting within the next 12 months. And it's a pretty extensive list. We've got um, CA7 on the mainframe. Uh, the other mainframe schedulers are JobTrack, um, IBM's IWS on the mainframe. And then on the distributed side, um, we have also uh, IWS on the distributed side, Autosys, and Tidal. Uh, what we're working on now and are planning on releasing uh, in just a month or so is also support for Control-M on the distributed side and uh, ato the atomic uh, automation engine itself on the distributed side. So uh, as a as a company, Broadcom is committed to expanding the portfolio of automation engines that we support so that we can give you more of a holistic view. We'll, we'll be continuously adding new engines. Um, we're, we're also going to be including ESP and D-Series in, uh, in 2021. And uh, what's not listed on this slide, which is really important and uh, it's mentioned, is that we also have a framework within which you can integrate additional automation solutions uh, into, into the platform that we provide. So as Dan was talking about those automation trends earlier, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the points he made was that the trend in automation is to have uh, external applications that are doing their own automation of, of uh, data-driven processes that may exist outside of any of these um, scheduling engines. Yet they do, they will integrate. You know, you will have some external application that, that may have multiple steps and it's being managed outside of one of these vendor provide, provided solutions, but at the end, it may kick off, say, an autosys job on the distributed side. So through the, through, uh, our programming framework, you can actually bring that external data into the platform and really see an end to end solution uh, where you can track the critical path of these applications from the external application to the vendor provided solution and then um, back to an end external application. So um, I, I'm just curious, um, uh, Dan, if you have anything that you'd like to add to this discussion. I know you, you covered this a bit, but um, I'm just kind of curious what kind of trends you're seeing in this area. Right. Well, certainly, um, there's, there is this sort of cross-platform concern and, uh, you, you know, the, the idea that, you know, we still have very mainframe versus distributed worlds, um, it, it really is useful to, to have the automation intelligence bring those two together where, where they haven't been brought together more, more directly. Um, it, it, you know, and be, because a lot of jobs these days will start in one and and then carry on in in the other. So it may it may start in the distributor and end with the mainframe or vice versa. And being able to see that holistically, I think, is is a real benefit. Yeah, that's definitely been our experience. And then it's also you know while while Broadcom provides several different automation engine solutions, um, we're also well aware of the fact that there are other competitive automation engines. And it, because of what we were talking about earlier, the difficulty in migrating to a single solution, inevitably you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have multiple vendor solutions within a large IT organization. So we're committed to being able to provide the same level of enhanced analytics um, across all of those different uh, vendor provided solutions. And some of the things that, um, that, that we do well, uh, I think, is um, the dynamic critical path discovery is really important. Like, as you're managing your services, what you really are interested in is understanding what the critical path is through these very complex applications. Uh, a single uh, SLA on a job may have thousands of upstream jobs, and, and if you're trying to get that SLA to uh, come in a half an hour earlier, what you really need to understand is not all of the thousands of jobs, I mean, that's interesting, but what's really important is what is the critical path up to that, uh, that job that's, that has the SLA on it. And that critical path is dynamic. It can change from day to day. Some job may run 
you know, longer on Fridays. And on Fridays, it becomes part of the critical path. But during the rest of the week, it's not part of the critical path. So in, in your optimization efforts, being able to understand a critical path and the historical trends of the critical path are really, really important. So that's one area that we focus quite a bit on uh, within atomic automation intelligence. And another area is also being able to elevate the monitoring of your of your processes to a business area. So these these jobs, as you know, are uh, there. There's a lot of them, and they have very cryptic names that would mean nothing to uh, a business owner. So by being able to associate uh, these cryptic jobs with a line of business that makes sense to a business owner is, is critical, and to be able to report on it from that perspective. You know, how is my equities uh, division doing tonight? Um, makes sense to a line of business as opposed to, you know, some uh, eight-character mainframe job name, you know, that's so cryptic that, that nobody can understand what it means. So being able to align these cryptic processes with business with biz, lines of business is also uh, an area that we focus on. And then, of course, predict prediction is huge. As you're monitoring your services, as they're progressing through the evening, um, if some job fails, it's very important to understand what the downstream impact is, what business services are going to be affected, how late are they going to be. You need to get predictive alerts and um, and and have visibility, so so you will you can know you know at 2 a.m. that that job that doesn't start until 6 a.m. is predicted to miss its SLA because something upstream uh, is running longer than anticipated. So having these dynamically recalculated predictions based upon the the current state of the workload is is really helpful from an analytics perspective. And then the, the last bullet point here is improved change control, which we've talked about a bit, um, being able to deliver changes into your automation uh, ecosystem with confidence that those changes aren't going to uh, cause any problems with your SLAs. So as I was talking about um, with untangling your business processes, so the things that you might not be aware of is where your jobs um, have dependencies on other business processes. So through um, establishing an SLA on a particular job, uh, what we would what we do within atom, atomic automation intelligence is we trace all of the upstream dependencies of that job, and it can be very fascinating that you'll find that your application is dependent upon other business applications that you weren't even aware of. Uh, some job somewhere is. Um, has a dependency on a, um, you know, a, an application that you haven't even heard of, but but uh, it's it's receiving a file from it or something like that. So it's really important to have that um, that knowledge of where your dependencies reside. And um, sometimes these dependencies can cross platforms and cross vendors. And so that again is very important to be able to to, to trace your business services across platforms and vendors. And then to see the critical path um, through through that process. Uh, another another interesting um, area of analytics is correlating how your applications are performing uh, with their with resource usage. So you may find um, that you 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 make use of within your underlying schedulers virtual resources. Many of these automation engines have their own implementations of virtual resources which is a way of, of um, throttling your, uh, your workload so that you don't um, run into contention issues. So it's, it's a technique that's used for load balancing, so you don't have too many jobs running at the same time. Uh, so you kind of associate them with a resource and, and put a limit on that resource so that you don't have too many of a certain type of job running. But what, what can happen with that is that you don't realize that your critical path is actually being quite affected by waiting for a virtual resource to free up. And um, having that type of visibility is really important and it becomes very difficult as these, as these systems evolve and become more complex, more jobs are being added that are using resources. It's very easy to lose track of 
what applications are using what resources when and um, seeing the impact on your critical SLAs. So by, by bringing that to the forefront, um, it can really help, uh, help you deliver your service more efficiently, which is what, we're, we're, what our goal is. And of course, um, in order to deliver a service uh, reliably, it's important to understand what reliably means. So that means establishing an SLA for a service. And uh, with Atomic Automation Intelligence, the approach we take is that we will take a look at how your service or application has run historically and provide you with a default SLA uh, based upon the historical averages. We've noticed that um, typically this application completes at, at 6 a.m. plus or minus 20 minutes. So we're going to give you a default SLA of, of 6.20 in the morning um, to give you a little bit of, of headroom. Of course, you can override that if you know that your actual SLA to your business requires that, th that it be completed by 6 a.m. You can override that and put your own SLA in. But once you've established the SLA, uh, then, then, that, then that becomes the, um, the critical data point with which you can do all of your reporting and your monitoring. So if you're, if you're predicting this application as it's executing, uh, you, want it, you want to predict whether it's going to be early on time or late. And that concept of late, of course, is in relationship to the SLA that you establish. And uh, similarly, if you want to do a historical report and say, how has my application performed over the last 90 days, I want to see how it's performed in relationship to its SLA. So establishing the SLA is, is a critical part of the, um, the whole analytic solution. Uh, and being able to, of course, we've talked about monitoring these SLAs in real time. As your application is executing, you're predicting whether or not you're going to meet or miss your SLA and, uh, and, and send alerts to the appropriate um, interested parties if, if in fact, it's, it's looking like you have an SLA breach um, in progress. It's also important when you get that alert that you understand what the root cause of that um, potential SLA breach is. Um, I, maybe, maybe you're not going to make your SLA because a job failed. What job is that? That job could be, um, you know, five hours prior to your SLA. And you may not even realize when you get when you see that a job fails that it's going to impact six or seven of your downstream SLAs. So it's really important when you get these alerts that the root cause is uh, is is included. And um, another important factor is is to understand what what to do some what if analysis. So let's say you get an alert that uh, a job failed and you're going to miss your SLA. What you might want to do is say, well, what if I restart that job right now? Will I make my SLA? What if I restart that job in an hour? Will I make my SLA? So you understand what the, um, the impact is of that failure. And then um, another point that's really uh, important with, that we, we can help you with with atomic automation intelligence is predicting the unpredictable. So the predictions that we, that we do uh, in a topic automation intelligence are complex, and um, we take a lot of data points into consideration in doing our predictions. We look at all the dependencies between the jobs. We look at the calendars. You know, certain jobs are only scheduled to run Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, you know, various types of conditions on the jobs, the virtual resources, et cetera. Um, and then we, com we combine that with historical average durations for the jobs to really give you a good prediction of when your SLA um, is scheduled, uh, you know, to, to whether it'll be early or late. And while that is a lot of complex calculation, it's actually is relatively predictable. Uh, once you have all those data points, it's easy to understand. It's not easy, but it's doable to predict when you're, if you're going to miss your SLA or not. There are certain things that are unpredictable. You may have event, you know, triggered uh, applications where somebody, um, somebody external to the, to the whole workload automation ecosystem it does some event and that triggers a job which will then start an entire uh, 
an, an entire downstream workflow. And there's no way to predict when that event is going to happen. It's not defined in the scheduler. It doesn't, there's, there's no job that has a hard start time or a dependency on another job. Uh, it just, it just starts for no apparent reason, um, that's visible within the automation environment, within the automation environment. So with atomic automation intelligence, what we're able to do is look at the historical data and understand these jobs that have no predictable start time and see a pattern for when they actually start and be able to make that prediction. Because once you can predict when that job that really is, quote, unpredictable will start, you can then predict everything downstream of it. So this could be jobs that start when, a, a, like, a, for example, uh, you might have a data set trigger on the mainframe where a data set arrives at some unknown time and that starts a, a mainframe process. Um, a user uh, self-serves a job, um, et cetera. So this is a, a, an interesting area and uh, something that is ever evolving with us is to be able to improve our predictions by, by predicting the unpredictable. And, um, you know, I think um, actually I'm just curious, Dan, with the, with the automation trends that you've been seeing, um, is this something that, that um, has come up in, in your experience? Well, certainly we've seen a, a big increase in event-based triggers versus uh, time-based triggers. So instead of, you know, this job starts at 8 p.m., it's, you know, it's based on the arrival of a file, an email, some event. Um, and th that has really been on the rise. And so to be able to use historical norms to add some predictability to the unpredictable there and then let you predict all the downstream. Yeah, I think it's, it's a huge uh, benefit to, to, to see because we've seen such, an, uh, such a rise in these event-triggered job streams. Um, so it's great that you have the capacity to start to predict those that were formerly unpredictable. Great, yeah, that's, that's been our experience. We've really been seeing that trend as well. So um, it's, a, it's an area that we've been focusing on quite a bit. Um, and then this, uh, this slide actually I've talked about uh, quite a bit already, so I don't think I'll spend too much time here, but this is just, um, you know, some of the, some of the tools that we're evolving right now that will allow you to uh, simulate uh, changes to your applications prior to moving them into production so that you can actually run a simulation of the proposed changes to your workload automation environment without making those changes. So, uh, what if I added these five jobs and changed these five dependencies? And uh, the, the new jobs that I'm adding, I anticipate they're going to run for, you know, five minutes, eight minutes, and ten minutes. Um, how is that going to affect my SLAs? So this uh, ability to simulate your your changes and and see the impact on the SLAs is also an exciting um, new area of the, of analytics that we're offering. And um, of course, um, historical reporting is is essential for any uh, good analytic solution to be able to uh, understand historically how, it, how you uh, made or missed your SLAs, um, how how has it aligned with your business areas, how the business areas performed historically, trend analysis, et cetera. So um, a robust uh, reporting solution, of course, is an uh, integral component to any good analytic solution. And uh, to, to sum it up, I just uh, would like to reiterate that um, appropriately applied automation intelligence will help you deliver a higher quality service to all of your stakeholders, which is ultimately what we're trying to do is, uh, is deliver a service. So thank you so much for, um, for attending uh, today's webinar. It's been uh, nice to be with you whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you. And um, with that, I would like to pass it back over to Raleigh to see if there's any questions. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Before we jump into the questions, I wanted to let the audience know that I will also be including this URL to this video in the follow-up email, so I hope you will check that out. Jennifer, let's go ahead and jump into the questions starting with you. The first one is, is there a way to deliver management reports via email? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, it's it's uh, oftentimes, um, you know, manage, the manager level uh, 
uh, people that are interested in this are not going to be logging into the system to run reports themselves. So, of course, you can deliver the reports via email on a scheduled basis, um, however you'd like. Good to know. Thank you. Dan, jumping over to you, isn't it better to migrate to one WLA rather than you use automation intelligence to create a holistic view? You know, I think there's uh, as many users, there's that many answers to that question, right? It depends on your environment. So uh, for some, migrating to, you know, a, a much newer tool, um, trying to get cohesiveness that way may be the right path. But uh, as we talk, for many, um, a migration is either not in the cards, they have some legacy reasons to keep some of those uh, other systems operating, or it's just, uh, it's a lot of time they don't want to dedicate uh, because it's not really uh, moving forward. And and so for, for many organizations, I think finding another way to sort of live with those two environments and using automation intelligence to bring that cohesive view together, it may be a much better outcome. Uh, it, you know, I think it just depends on each situation. but. It's great to know that you have options, uh, that you could migrate or you could uh, keep everything in place and uh, bring it together through the use of a different tool. Thanks, Dan. Let's take one more question. Jennifer, this one is for you. How do you get the data from the underlying automation engines? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for that question. That's a very good question. Um, and uh, it, it actually varies. So um, as you saw, we support many different mul multiple automation engines. And each of the automation engines um, saves their data in a very proprietary and um, opaque form. So it's, 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 it's the most challenging part of supporting an automation engine is figuring out how we're going to get the data. And it's, it's a combination of definitional data and event data. We need to know all of the jobs and their dependencies, uh, when all the calendaring conditions, et cetera, and then also um, have a, a real-time or near real-time feed of the events as jobs are, are starting and stopping. And in some cases, um, the connector that we build to an automation engine will go against the database. Uh, so for example, for Autosys on the distributed side, uh, all of the data is in a relational database, so we're we're querying the database on uh, regularly scheduled intervals to get to get the data. Um, in other cases, there's APIs that are provided uh, by the automation engine where we can get this data. Um, th there's a variety of ways, and it varies from engine to engine. So that's um, that's a that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks for your insight, Jennifer, on that. There are some questions we weren't able to get to. I will go ahead and send those on to the speakers. I would like to thank everyone for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. As I mentioned at the start of the event, you will be receiving a follow-up email from EMA with resources from today's event, so I hope you'll check that out. And I hope that we'll see you at a future EMA research webinar. Thanks again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.